Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's Andrew Matner from uh, Attitude Advisory here today. Um, today, I'm joined by our CEO and General Manager of our Wealth Division, Catapult Wealth, Tony Cat, um, to talk about uh, investment markets and and things like that in you know amongst this coronavirus um, situation that we're all faced. Um, I know in the Attitude team, we've been getting lots of queries and, and comments and discussion from clients about what's happening in investment markets and interest rates and, and things like that. So I thought, you know, rather than um, try and answer all, all those things, um, some, some that I'm, I'm qualified to answer, some that I'm not qualified to answer, I thought I'd get the uh, experts involved and invite Tony along uh, for, a, for a chat and, and answer some of those questions. So thank you, Tony, for making the time for us. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. Very good. Um, so we, we've obviously been on a little bit of a roller coaster over the last couple of months um, with investment markets and, and things like that. Um, can you maybe just give us your your thoughts on, um, you know, obviously where we're at, um, you know, some of the timing, some of the things that you, you've seen in, in investment markets over the over the last couple of months? Yeah, look, thanks, Andrew. Um, it has been unprecedented, probably the word that I've heard the most of the last six weeks. Um, unprecedented times, unprecedented events, unprecedented markets. And um, I think that the number one thing that's caught everyone here, oh, I suppose I'd have to argue by surprise, is the speed, the speed of this and, and, yeah. and necessity to make change really quickly. And um, there's nothing that the markets and in any markets they hate more than uncertainty and that's exactly what we've got right now and um and at the moment we um we're probably coming out the other side to a degree with more certainty about where we stand but in the middle of march when the markets um the all lords hit its lowest point for for probably since the gfc which was 5400 points um sorry 4400 points um was uh, where uncertainty um, reigned supreme and people were extrapolating bad news. So people were, uh, human nature is you see bad news, you just think it's going to go on forever. Yeah. And uh, and that was when we saw the lows around of the All Lords and the American markets and European markets in March. As we've started to work our way through that and some of the unknowns have become known, um, such as, and, with, and, and health governments worldwide and so on have worked on this problem and and the Australian government and New Zealand government have particularly done a very good job, is that um, there's more knowns around uh, where does cash flow sit, what does demand look like in a, I'll call it an isolation type model, um, who are the haves and the have-nots. Um, when I say the haves, such as there are certain businesses that have benefited from this whole situation, and there are certain businesses that have suffered at, at this at, out of this situation. So um, we're slowly working our way through that. Um, and to give you an example of probably where we've got to now is the banks have started doing all their um, bad debt provisioning. Uh, so uh, Westpac and National Bank have done their bad debt provisioning uh, in the last 48 hours. And um, National Bank has come out and provisioned, I'll call it for a worst case scenario, which um, includes 30% uh, drop off in house prices, mm -hmm. uh, provisioning for a certain level of um, bad debts and businesses going bust um, that have, you know, doubled the GFC type levels. Um, so they've assumed a very, very um, bearish case. That capital raising they did allowed for that. And what was interesting yesterday is the share prices of all those businesses, all the banks actually went up. Yeah. <laughs> so it showed that we're probably close to really, I call it scorched earth type scenario being factored into markets at the moment. So yeah, okay. hopefully um, we're closer to the end of this than we were at the start. Yeah. So we obviously saw that drop to 4,400 and, and the market's recovered somewhat since. What, what's, uh, you know, you described the certainty or confidence or information in the market. Uh, how, how do you think that's going to continue to to move through through the markets over the, the coming weeks, months, 12 months, whatever it might be. How, how long before you you think we will sell, I suppose, uh, um, some stability or, you know, some 
some reliability in terms of uh, growth or, or or trends in in the market? It's, it's going to be um, uh, what I would argue is that the market um, there are certain parts of the market such as the banks, uh, oil stocks, which I'll maybe able to touch on today, tourism, travel, you know, airline type stocks that. For them to start to recover, for that part of the market starts to recover, we have to see what I'll call it the new normal looks like. Mm-hmm. So Scott Morrison's come out and said that we will not be um, removing the social distancing rules until we have vax- a vaccine. Well, we may never have a vaccine. And so that's still an unknown. And therefore, people still don't know what travel demand's going to look like uh, in six months' time, they still don't know what airline demand will look like. They still don't know what um, number of businesses that are uh, going to go bankrupt. And it's interesting, even with the oil stocks, airlines, I think, um, comprise a 36% of worldwide oil demand. Yeah. So until planes start getting back in the air, and, and best case in Australia at the moment, they're talking about not till January will our airports even remotely open up to international travel. So, you know, these things are still unknown. So even though I think we're starting to see a, a, a sent, some sentiment improve, um, we still have a long way to go to find out what um, what that looks like. Yeah, okay. And, and it's interesting. I mean, Tony, you just touched on oil prices there and, you know, we, we saw, you know, some oil futures prices a couple of weeks ago go into to negative because of that, you know, the current supply versus demand scenarios that that's going on and I, I suppose with oil prices as they they are at the minute you know we've seen fuel prices now I know in Adelaide in you know in the low 80 cents a, a, a litre for for everyone that's struggling on that side well there's obviously benefits that come the other side so you know you're if you're in transport or logistics or some of those other industries that you know, it's not that long ago where fuel was a dollar fifty or a dollar sixty a litre. All of a sudden, they've seen their fuel price drop by half. There, there's obviously for every loser, there can be a winner as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, it, it is interesting that that <laughs> the un, unwanted outcome of maybe of this is that it might uh, deter the move to electric vehicles and battery technology over the next five years. This uh, this current circumstance, which would, wouldn't be great for the planet, but um, but yeah, you're right. There are winners out of it that, and mm. even the airline industry themselves, once they do get back up and flying, if oil prices stay at twenty to thirty dollars a barrel, they're a major winner out of that. Um, but I, I think that you'll see a slow um, but sure um, uh, improvement in demand where oil prices will renormalise back to where they were. So yeah, I, I think that the broader issue is actually with oil prices for me, as I mentioned before, is on the where does battery technology and electric vehicles go from here? For me, that's a, a medium, long-term negative for the oil price uh, once yeah. we get through this current situation. Yeah, okay. Um, interesting, and, and you know, we, we talk about um, something, and you touched on it before, about obviously banks and their provisioning, and, and I saw National Bank came out and said, you know, they've cut their dividend from 80-odd cents to, to 30 cents. Well, one of the things that I know... Um, you, you talk to your clients a lot about is the importance of, of yield and cash flow coming out of investments and, you know, worry worry about that. Don't worry necessarily about the, the stock price. You know, you, you bank the income, not the, the actual capital. Um, if this is going to be a, a continuing trend, I mean, what, what impact do you see these, you know, reduced earnings and, and reduced dividend payouts having on, on the market as a whole? Um, and then there's obviously these knock-on impacts to retirees or or others that that rely on on those income streams. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I I I really do think that it's it's a temporary phenomenon. I I mean, I whether we get a vaccine or not, or um, the banks, you know, the the Australian banks particularly are in a four times better shape than they were during the GFC. So. I think their balance sheets are excellent. I think they're part of the solution, not the problem, uh, in terms of helping a lot of businesses through this issue. Um, and ultimately, um, the, you know, they're going to still going to get through this. And whether we're talking a year, a year and a half, that their margins uh, will return to normal, um, their funding mechanisms will return to normal, and and it's it's my strong belief that in the short the, the short term dividend cuts and things that they're taking is a necessity 
and, and I'll call it part of their good governance to protect the shareholders and protect their um, and protect the bank itself. So I, I think that these are temporary cash flow issues that these companies are facing and, and my belief in the medium term, in the year and a half, we won't even be having these conversations anymore. Um, what I will say though, and, and we did sort of go through this in the GFC, is that um, there are some businesses that are going to take longer to recover on that front than others, whether it be yeah. the travel companies like Flight Centre or things like that. Their dividends aren't going to just rebound in 12 months' time. Mm -hmm. And um, like the oil companies are going to take some time once the oil price starts to stabilise as well. So, but on the flip side of that, you don't forget that I still think that I think there are certain stocks like we've seen with Coles and West Farmers with their Bunnings stores. There's a lot of technology stocks. There's a lot of stocks that have actually um, not experienced any real noticeable um, difference, BHP, Rio Tinto, uh, in their earnings, and therefore are going to continue to pay dividends at the levels they were. So yeah. I think across the board, it will be interesting to see how much cash flow is affected. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, you touched on some sector type stuff there. You, know, you mentioned you know, airlines, travel, you know, retail and, and mining resources and stuff like that on the other side. Um, and, you know, it's clear that um, I think to all of us that, you know, it, it's really, a, it, it's probably a case of the haves and the have nots to a, to a degree at the minute. Now, that that to a point, I think, in, or what I understand, probably presents some opportunities in the market as anything. Do you want to maybe shed some some thoughts on on your analyst view or your research views about which sectors we you know are actually you know you, you feel or you're relatively confident with and and perhaps other sectors that you know we're not so confident with well i think the first comment i want to make is that i think that the um first thing we're very wary of is um australian dollar so the Australian dollar dropped into the mid 50s. Um, it's bounced back to 65 cents today, as I've I've seen it, and against the US currency. And after the GFC, what happened was that the um, American economy, with uh, Lehman Brothers collapsing and things like that, um, was very um, in the doldrums. I'll probably call it best um, put for an extended period of time. And the Australian economy back then dealt with it better than the US economy did in relative terms. What we saw then in 2009, 10, 11, it was the Aussie dollar recovered back to, I think, a dollar 10 against the US currency. Yeah. Um, there is a, we still have an extreme amount of concern for, well, concern or I'll call it crystal ball gazing, that Australia has handled this in so far so good that we might be able to get back up and running faster than a lot of other economies. At the US, it's a bit patchy and unknown in terms of they might need to shut, do rolling shutdowns and other things like Singapore has had to do. So there is some fear at the moment um, that the Aussie dollar may bounce back up and it could head back up towards 80 or 90 cents over the next couple of years. So you've, I'm just warning clients to be very careful and aware of that risk, I suppose I'll call it, of, of the Aussie dollar increasing. The other thing I want to comment on is... Um, just, just, just on that, before we go on, that, that obviously then impacts, because I know... Uh, I've got a, a number of clients that, um, f for whatever reason, with their strategy, heavily invested in U.S. stocks or, or overseas stocks. Um, you know, obviously, a current the currency moving that far is obviously then going to significantly devalue devalue where you know any gains that might have occurred in those markets. Yeah, it's a headwind, yeah. yeah. So you might see underlying share price growth if you owned Apple shares or Google shares or something like that, but you might just um, be giving that back by the currency movement. Yeah. So you need to be very mindful of that um, over the next uh, over the next couple of years, I think. Um, yeah, good point. It's been a tailwind to some degree over the last four years, and that yeah. made it a headwind. Yeah. Um, the other point that I want to make today is that interest rates, uh, cash rates, term deposit rates were already low, and now they're basically going to move to zero uh, for the next 10 years, five years. You know, it is so for retirees and people with money in the bank account uh, for term deposits, you're going to earn between 0 and 1% for a very long period of time. And you know, I think the Australian government 10-year bond at the moment sits at 0.55 of a percent. So that gives you an idea yeah. of how low interest rates they're forecasting going to remain for 10 years. Yeah. Um, it, it, that 
the reason why I bring that up is if that's the case, we're going to wake up in a post-COVID world where people with money in the bank or term deposits, and particularly, they can't live off zero income. They can't live off zero growth. Mm -hmm. And so people are going to wake up and go, what do I do with my money? Do I go to the property market? Do I go to a commercial property market? Do I put it in the share market? Those, those themes, I'm going to call them, are going to come back. And before this all happened, there was a chase for yield because people were saying, well, I can't retire on zero income. I reckon we'll return to that world. So good quality businesses with good quality assets, with good quality income streams will absolutely be in vogue in a post-COVID world. And, you know, that's where I think we, if we look through the, the hourglass a little bit, is that the whether it be the CSLs or the Macquarie Groups or, you know, the BHPs, or there are businesses, even West Farmers, those businesses that have got their balance sheet in order, they got a good business, they run a good show, they've got a good management team. Those businesses on the flip side of this are still going to be good businesses and mm. um, they're still going to be good investments. Yeah. Um, so the only other, probably one last thing I'll probably say on that front is things that have absolutely come to the fore um, in this environment has been um, technology stock. So the need for cloud-based, you've seen it with your cloud-based accounting, Andrew, with cloud-based services like Zoom and, and the way we interact with clients and the way we interact with teams, um, mm -hmm. and the way we interact with customers um, has not, it hasn't, we certainly knew this world was coming, but I think it's been sped up. And therefore, some a lot of technology stocks and a lot of innovations coming through the pipeline, which is really exciting. And I think those stocks particularly are are, are going to be really interesting down the, over the next twelve months. Yeah, cool. Um, Tony, we, we've seen a bit of noise. I'll call it noise in, in the last you know twenty four, forty eight hours or so regarding, um, I'll call it um, you know pending pending fight with China. Um, you know, I know um, 40, I think it's 40 percent of our exports or something like that go into China, whether it be resources or wine or education or tourism or, or whatever it might be. Um, you mentioned before about the US economy and, and how that reacts to, to this whole scenario and how long it takes to, to come back to that. Do you have any views that given, you know, we've got certain companies or, or sectors or whatever that are reliant on overseas markets in in terms of looking for stability yields return is it going to be do you see any return to to a a theme where um australians are focusing on australian companies doing business with australian citizens that aren't exposed to export markets aren't going to be impacted necessarily by currency movements or any of that sort of stuff. Do you do you see that potentially that, you know, there, there's opportunities there or, or maybe an emerging trend in, in that type of behaviour? Um, so probably two comments there. I think in the immediate term, Andrew, I think we will. I think we'll mm. see, uh, like after we saw with the, I, I love what this whole event, like we saw with the fires, will do to, human beings helping other human beings. So I think in the very immediate term, we're going to see people support each other. We're going to support local businesses. We're going to do everything we can to make sure the Australian economy and the businesses within it are operating at an optimum level. So I think that, and that I'm excited. I'm already seeing examples of that, I think, in, in our own country. And um, look, I, I think that will help New Zealand out where we might open up a lot more opportunity to trade with New Zealand probably a lot more actively than we have in the past as well and, and freeing that up. But I say that with a smile because I see that happening maybe for a while, but no one could ignore the growth market of what China is and no one, mm. human beings being human beings, they'll, they'll chase growth and they will chase um, <laughs> the big markets and 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 I, I I think there'll be a little bit of in two years time return to normal activities of saying okay well what can we do globally and mm -hmm. um, and that's okay you know if, if if people want to go back to doing that that's that's great I think in the immediate term we'll look after one another longer term it'll be a return to growth yeah okay um, and, and I I can't a little bit of the I call it chest beating going on about China being investigated and. They're not happy and we're not happy. And I, I think that's a lot of polit politician speak and politicking, yeah. Chess beating and 
the reality is business is just business. Okay. Do you, just in, in that though, you know, one of the sectors that has had a serious decline in Australia in the last 10 or more years has been the manufacturing sector. And, you know, I know I've had a lot of clients that have been, you know, impacted to some degree with supply issues due to lockdowns and other things like that that have, have gone on. Do, do you see a potential re-emergence of, um, I won't say Holden, but, you know, re-emergence of, of manufacturing supply chain type things within Australia? Um, and, and is there any way we can stay competitive you know, competitive in that space or, or like you said, are we just going to, you know, immediately or as soon as practical revert to the to the lowest common denominator in, you know, in line with what has been, you know, self-interest behaviour, I'll call it. Oh, I, yeah, I heard, a, I heard a story about, I think a plumber rang up a radio this exact, on this exact topic and he was talking about, and forgive me because I'm not a plumber, but obviously, and, and he was talking about a certain bracket that he needed to install parts of uh, his plumbing devices and and to get that bracket made and developed in Australia was going to cost, I think he quoted on the um, something like $14 per bracket. Mm-hmm. He can get the same bracket, uh, where does cash flow sit, or 38 cents. Yeah. Now, as much as you want to support Australia and you want to do things in Australia and everyone, but it's not even, it's not even a contest if you're talking mm-hmm. about 38 cents versus $14. And, and I'm afraid that, yes, we would, I think that innovation like, out of the GFC came Uber. We saw a lot of innovation in airports and t- security technology that came out of the September 11 incidents. And we're going to see an enormous amount of innovation come out of, COVID, this COVID situation. So I think the innovation's exciting. Do yeah. I think we're just going to go to plain old, oh, we just got to do it in Australia because we need access to it, even though it's not competitive? I can't see us returning to that, that yeah. normal. Um, cool. I think if we can do it in a clever way and do it cost effectively, great. Excellent. That's good. Some good thoughts. Um, one last thing before I let you go there, there's one of the stimulus. Um, Scenarios. One of the stimulus options that people have been given is um, early access to ten thousand dollars of their superannuation. Um, you know, and obviously there's going to be certain people out there who are going to actually need that money because they've been stood down from their job and they, you know, need to buy groceries and and other bits and pieces. There, there's potentially other people that will will just use it as an opportunity to get hold of some some money and and do something with it that because they wouldn't have been able to get access to it until they're 65 or, or whatever. Uh, I'm really keen to hear your opinion on, um, you know, the, I'll call it the, the short-term, short-term gain versus the long-term pain or vice versa in, in terms of that, that strategy or, or accessing superannuation, you know, monies at, at this point. Yeah, look, um, yeah, you're right. As long as the, the government's put in place a set of rules uh, to say give you access to ten thousand dollars before thirtieth of June and ten thousand dollars after, and those set of rules, uh, which um, I won't go into too much detail today, but you know, around if you've had certain uh, cutback in hours, if you're, uh, you're employed, or certain cutback in revenue if you're self-employed, and so on. If there are some people that will, if you're eligible for it but don't need the money, there are strategies, and you could probably suggest it's completely legal to take $10,000 out and re-contribute it back into the super fund uh, and claim a tax deduction for that. My view, you could take the money out and invest it. My view of, of all this is if you, you've you got to do what's right for you. Um, I think that if you're eligible for it within the rules, um, speak to your advisor, speak to somebody that knows your situation, Think through your long-term goals, think through the tax implications, and it's you know whether it's inside or outside superannuation, it's your money. <laughs> it's your money. It's your future. It's it's for you to control within the realms of what you have in your life, and you do what's best for you. Um, this whole I oh, don't take it out of super just because it'll be there for till you're sixty. Yeah, yes, but do what's right for you. And, cool. and make sure you get advice around that. So uh, I'm not suggesting people should or shouldn't get it out, but I'm suggesting they should have a conversation around it. Excellent. Good. Um, one final thing. No, sorry, I've, I've just I've made up one more question. Um, 
Um, and this is a philosophical question. Um, the, this um, crisis, is, is, as you alluded to earlier, has created uh, a lot of uncertainty, um, uh, a lot of anxiety um, for, for people in, in relation to that. Um, I'm interested in just one final wrap up. Is, is this, um, in your view, does this present opportunities or does it present a time to, you know, go into your shell and, and, and retreat or, you know, from an, from an investor's um, investment advisor's perspective, you know, should we be, or, you know, should they be looking at, at the other side of this or, you know, the opportunities that present at the minute? What, what's your, your feel on that? Look, I think it absolutely has to look at it as, a, as an opportunity um, for people that are looking at buying homes, for people looking at buying commercial properties, for people looking at buying into the share market. Um, a lot of us are, you know, I'll call it long-term accumulators of assets. Um, and and at the end of the day, you've got to look at the situation and, and see it as, as presenting an opportunity to buy good assets at a good time. And... And ultimately, that's you're never going to pick the bottom of the markets. You're never going to pick the best time, and 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 you never will. And I, I, I don't know what's around the corner tomorrow or the next day, but I do know that at the moment it is presenting some opportunities to buy good assets at good times. Cool. Well, thank you, mate. That's been great. I think there's been some some absolute nuggets of gold in there that you've you've shared with us. Some. Um, uh, some great insights that that people can take away and and review and digest. Um, if they want any more information, they can obviously contact you. Do you want to just um, fire out your your email and contact number for everybody? Uh, so my email is just Tony T O N Y at catapultwealth dot com dot au, or feel free to ring eight one seven two nine triple one. Cool. Um, and if you didn't catch that, anybody, feel free to obviously contact Kristen or myself or one of the other Attitude Advisors, and and we can connect you with the the guys at Catapult Wealth. So thank you, Tony. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. Cheers.